this is uh, my presentation. That's not about my purpose. So Mark's slide earlier um, kind of sets this deck up, actually. So what I'm here to do is talk about purpose and what I've seen over the last few years working in various organizations or have done, um, what I think is a, key, is a key driver for employee engagement and getting people behind the brand. Um, just before I give you context as to where I come from and what I do, can I just see a show of hands as to how many people work for larger organizations here? Okay, and uh, smaller SMEs? Okay, fine, okay. Um, so my background is, well, my background and what I do is internal comms. Um, I've worked on the leadership team at Transport for London. I'm now on the leadership team at BBC. So culture and uh, purpose is kind of what we do on a daily basis. Um, I previously, previously worked at Hiscox as well, where purpose was um, kind of talked about, but not really um, done much about. But why am I here? We, Andy came up to visit us at the BBC just after the Dane Janet Smith report went out, you know, the Jimmy Savile stuff. And just started to, we started to talk about what we're going to do about the culture. Obviously, we have to change the culture at the BBC. So there's a big program of work happening up there. But then we started talking about different things as well, about engagement. How do we engage people in the organisation? How do we engage people with work? You know, you have this, you have this massive, massive thing happen. So how do people get engaged? It's like I shared, a, I shared my thoughts. I shared my uh, ideas. And Andy just sat there and said, stroked his beard and said, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Come down and talk at this thing. So I said yes. I don't actually know if you, if you thought it was a good idea or a bad idea. So if, it's, if it fails completely, you can blame this man over here. So first of all, purpose. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of narrative around purpose at the moment. And as someone tasked with delivering understanding of purpose and someone you know, who's tasked with making sure our employees get our purpose through the various organisations I work for, it hasn't really sat with me. I don't, I don't, really, I don't really get it. So... This presentation is around kind of exploring that, um, that purpose and what it means. So these are a couple of well-known uh, statements which kind of, which kind of look at um, what purpose actually is. Organisational purpose expresses the company's fundamental value. Great. The reason for the existence, it's the end to which the strategy is directed. That's great for a company, but what does it mean for an employee? Uh, to me, it means nothing to the employee. You, can, you know where your company's going, but so what? What about engagement? What, what does that mean to me? And then the next statement is where, where strategy is concerned with, an, with what an organisation wants to achieve and how it will happen. You know, it's, that's great. It's great for the organisation, but what, is, what about me as a human, as a person? What about my needs? So, yeah, I'm just, it didn't sit comfortably with me, and it's quite hard for me to stand on stage and say, yeah, you know, as a person tasked with delivering this stuff, this is what purpose means to me. This is, you know, this is what I get up every day for. I need to deliver a better life for my children. Uh, Gabriel and Rafferty, oh, Rafferty's the one crying because he just finally understands he's called Rafferty and he's going to live with that for the rest of his life. <laughs> Poor baby. Um, but yeah, that's what I bring to work. I don't necessarily always buy into the values I go into work for or the, the organisation I go into work for. I go into work to make a better place for these guys. And that's, that's, that's where I struggle, you know. It's like uh, Stringer Bell said, if you don't believe in the products, change the shit. So I'm trying to, trying to look at how things can change and how... Purpose isn't necessarily the golden bullet to all of these things we're talking about at the moment. But I do get purpose. I get purpose. I get purpose as a consumer. You know, I buy a brand. I, this is a, a well, kind of a small surfing brand that I buy into. I buy into the leadership values. I buy into the fact that they make good quality products for cold water surfers. That's not me, by the way. Um, and they, it's, they buy it from sustainable sources. I, I like that. I buy into it. But it's a lot different from buying a T-shirt to actually being employed by someone. But, you know, back on, on this note still, they, they keep reinforcing that their purpose with lovely stories around humans. So it, it makes me feel connect, connected to a tribe, connected to things I want to believe in, and reflecting out, you know, I'll probably put that slide up there so you think I'm a cool surfer. I'm a surfer for about 10 years. But I still buy into that whole, that whole ethos and that whole purpose. So it, that's where I see it working. Um, but I don't necessarily work in, in terms of employee engagement. Um, for certain organisations, it has to be said, not all organisations. I've done quite a lot of work on exploring purpose and trying to get that, get that messaging through. What, what, where are we going? What are we doing with this purpose? And a lot of the, um, a lot of the presentations I set up and a lot of the guys that are doing the, um, the decks talk about these guys. Probably everyone that here knows the story about when JFK went to NASA and he walked down the corridor and there's a janitor sweeping up. 
JFK said to him, what do, what do you do? And the guy said, well, I'm put, helping putting a man on the moon. He's like, yeah, of course you're going to say that. You work at bloody NASA, you're going to put a man on the moon. Yet if you went into another environment where, you know, say the call centre, for example, and you walk down the corridor and you saw a janitor sweeping up, he's not going to say, yeah, I'm sweeping up for, to, put, you know, to make energy more efficient for the rest of the UK. He's going to say, I've got a job, I've got family to support, I've got people relying on me. So that's, that's, where, that's where I'm struggling with this whole concept of purpose is the golden bullet for employee engagement and more productivity. It's not the end of the presentation. So I kind of look back over my career and just thought, okay, where, where did I most, where was I most engaged? Where did I really enjoy working? Where did I feel I could bring my whole self to work and deliver excellent, excellent work, excellent products? and build excellent relationships. And it's quite surprising, actually, given that I work in kind of the most creative organization in the world at the moment. But this place, worked here for a couple of years, a few years ago, and it's an insurance company. Is everyone familiar with Hiscox? Yeah, no? Yeah, so two, two worlds to Hiscox. You've got the London market, the big city guys who are insuring marine, spaceships, all that sort of stuff. But then you've got the business insurance as well. So a lot of, if, if a lot of you freelancers and entrepreneurs, you probably have insurance with Hiscox. Um, on the outside, it could seem quite boring. Actually, it's an insurance company. So how can this be more interesting than the current organisation I'm in at the moment or some organisations I've worked with in the past? I put it down to values. Um, so you can see the core values that Hiscox have got here. So quality, integrity, excellence, and ex uh, execution. Yeah, you, it could be any company, really. But the two main things were human and courage. Um, it's an insurance company, don't forget that. So courage, they live by courage. Courage was seen from the top down in every aspect of uh, Hiscox. So it was seen, you could see it in the board meetings, you could see it uh, in custom services, you could see it in every area of Hiscox. And human, and that didn't mean um, be nice to each other all the time. If you disagreed with someone, do it, but do it in a polite way, but have a constructive conversation and always think about what you're doing as well. And out of human comes trust, comes empathy, and it builds up all the stuff that you need for a growth, growth mindset and a growth mindset culture, which they had. I saw this in abundance, actually, when I was working there. And I'm just going to talk you through a couple of stories how I can kind of bring, that, bring those values to life in terms of the products. Everyone knows this guy, probably the most famous Welshman on the planet at the moment, Gareth Bale. So a group of underwriters got together and they were discussing football, basically. So this guy was sold to a club called Real Madrid a few years ago for £80 million. Um, if he would have got injured two weeks before that transfer went through, Tottenham Hotspur wouldn't have got the club who he played for at the time, wouldn't have got £80 million. They would have got the value of his contract. So would have, they wouldn't have paid 100 k a week, whatever he's on, for the rest of his contract if he didn't play again. So the guys got together and thought, actually, but his value is much more than his existing contract. What happens if we put an insurance product out into the market which values, a kind of, which values him at his current market value. So they did that. They put it together, they did some research and put it out in the marketplace, and it's a great success. So now it, enabled, it enables people to ensure the risk of losing a whacking great ton of money um, against anything else in the marketplace. So it's, it's kind of that thinking which was just go out, do it, and I think it was us two earlier that said just effing do it. Um, sorry, I'm on camera on BBC, so I'll be in the Daily Mail if I swear. Um, and they just went out and did it, and they tried it, and it worked, which is, which is a, great, a great story. Um, the other thing was uh, a guy called Kevin Kerridge went over to New York. They had an office in New York, and then started talking to the brokers out there. Uh, and he started asking about online broker platforms, and said, no, we don't do that in the States. It's, not, you know, we're not, it's never going to be ready for an online brokering platform in the States. So he came back, had a meeting with uh, Bronick, the... Uh, CEO, um, about two days later, got a lump sum of money, just went out there on his own. He turned up, he's got a really good story, turned up in a suitcase, didn't know where he was going to go, stayed in the hotel for several nights, started making contacts out there, and that's the fastest growing insurance broker in the US. And that's not done through not taking risks, that's not done through, um, it's not done through having a purpose, it was done through him having the ability to be trusted and go out there and work autonomously and just have the permission to go out and do stuff and try and do stuff. And now we've got, off, well, they've got office in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Dallas. You can see where they're going with that. So a couple of stories, and you might be thinking, yeah, but these are just like, these are high level guys who've probably been to Oxbridge and they're, you know, they're obviously going to be trusted in that environment to create, to create value for the organization. 
but it goes, goes way down as well. Uh, my mate had his buggy stolen from his shed, uh, so he was a Hiscox customer, phoned up, uh, and the girl uh, on the other line um, said, okay, fine, that's great. Um, what buggy was it? It's a bugaboo. Live in Tunbridge Wells, they will have buggy boos around there. Um, and she said, can you go onto the John Lewis website, tell me the price? She did, he did. Uh, and when within two hours, the money was back into his account. So that's the level of trust that they had in the, the, in the individual and customer service team as well. So it was, she wasn't necessarily for her purpose, but she was, she was allowed to do her job. She was trusted. She was, she was managed like a human, if it was managed at all. Um, and it's, it's kind of around the permissions um, where I think that culture, gr the culture was enabled and it allowed everyone to grow. And as I say, that culture was everywhere. But yeah, great. I mean, two good stories. You know, you, great stories about people being allowed to do stuff and work on their own. But what does that mean in the real world? This is Syscox share price over the last five years, outperforming the FTSE 250. I know people here are going to probably say share, point, uh, share price isn't the greatest indicator of how good a business is, but it's pretty bloody good. Uh, and you can see they're just continually growing because every time I went in there with an idea, it didn't matter whether I was talking to the HR department, the marketing department, the digital department, that they'd probably come up with a solution and they would want to work and explore it more. So that's where, that's a little story about where I felt most engaged. And that it was that mindset of actually, I trust you, I give you the permission to go and do some work. And that worked, that worked very well. And they've continued growing as well. So, um, presentation's actually a lot shorter than I thought. Does anyone know who this guy is? His name's Paul Buckheit, I think. Paul Buckheit. So, this guy worked at Google. He was employed at Google to work on Google Groups. And then he was emailing, emailing around the group um, quite a few years ago. And thought, actually, I can build a better email system than this. So, he started working in his own time to build an email system. That email system turned out to be Gmail. Um, and he went off and set his own company. So, Gmail now has one billion users, and it's better than most other email platforms. So again, that was, that was him working on his own accord. That was him being trusted. He wasn't necessarily buying into a purpose or being told we are, you know, we're going to organize the world's, organ, uh, organize the world's knowledge and information. He just thought, actually, you know what? I can do something better here, and I'm going to go and do it. And I'm going to be trusted to do it, and I deliver. And look at that product. Wow, I'd love to, have a, I'd love to make a product that's had one million users and 1% spam in there. But do you know what he also did? In the meeting, he's also able to talk up, and he also came up with a value, don't be evil, as well. So that guy is very, very under the radar. You hear, you hear of all the other founders, but it's these guys that are just given permission to do stuff and will come up with great, great work. Uh, so what does that mean? So this is a quote from Tom Kelly, who's um, GM of IDEO. Does everyone know who IDEO is here? Great, de great design company coming out of California. They don't just design things, they design processes and systems and they look at how, you know, African village could probably use water more efficiently, what, what does the end of life state involve and how can we improve end of life for people as well. So he's looking at ultimate freedom for creative groups, the freedom to experiment with some ideas. Um, and he's basically saying some sceptics insist that innovation is expensive, but from what I've seen in the organisations, if you're just sitting there and you're waiting to be paid, um, and you're not really in, engaged in the purpose of the organization, it's just a waste of money. But autonomy can be the antidote to that. And I firmly believe that autonomy, and this goes back to Mark's slide, autonomy was number two, but I firmly believe that autonomy is number one uh, for larger organizations um, there. So what does this mean? Um, yes, have a purpose, but don't expect staff to share it or it for the, to be the golden bullet uh, for engagement we at the BBC. We obviously have a purpose, we're there for a reason, um, but what we're seeing through all of our research and all of our surveys and all the conversations we're having with our employees is that they don't really care what BBC do. They care about Country File, they care about Radio 1, they care about the programmes they're working on. Um, and connecting these people to the BBC purpose just isn't going to work. It's too, it's too big a gap. You know, and I spoke to someone earlier who said, you know, the freelance world is going to increase by 30% of the workforce is going to be freelance. So how are you going to get freelancers to buy into your purpose? Not really. Like me, my purpose is to go into work to make a better life for my family. Um, and I do buy into a little bit of that, but you've got a whole changing demographic of workers coming, coming down the line. And to, to be focused on pinning energy into purpose is great um, for 
certain companies, but for most other companies, you should look at management theory and how they encourage autonomy. Um, allow staff to grow, explore, and interact. Um, that was one thing at Hiscox. We talked about um, the physical space as well. Um, it kind of, kind of happened organically at Hiscox. If you're uh, in the London market, you have to go into Lloyd's to meet your brokers. You bump into people, have a conversation. So the design of the building was replicating that. So you'd go into the foyer and you can bump into people. There's lots of breakout spaces where innovation happens. Um, and a, a, lot of, a lot of thinking was if you're, if you're not moving, you're not actually doing anything. So that, that kind of ethos was brought back in. And that's not just about, and that kind of plays into the explore and interact. We encouraged people to bump into each other, whether they're from the direct team or the broker team. And that's how ideas kind of spun up and got spun out. Uh, and encourage a growth mindset. So, yeah, that came all the way down from the top, and it was embedded in every department at Hiscox, I would say. Um, and there's something about data as well. So we had a lot of data available to um, us at Hiscox, but the ultimate, the ultimate decision was based on gut. That was Robert Hiscox actually said, if you, if you have any decision to make and you've got data, always trust your gut instinct. So that's bringing the human back into the workplace as well. And you can only go in your gut instinct if you really, really build trust. So that's a key thing we try to build. We try to build trust in, trust in, our, trust in everyone across the organization, trust in, in uh, customer services guys, trust in brokers. You could just go out and do stuff. You had the permission to fail um, to a degree. Um, and that's something we're trying to build back in the BBC as well. Um, but connecting, as I say, connecting those workers to the bigger brand, bigger purpose is quite difficult because it just doesn't fit anymore. Um, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. It's a bit shorter than I expected, but I'll fill it in with questions or something. Um, so in terms of automation, you know, we talked about automation in Mark's slide, automation number two. What we don't know is actually our whole mindset, our whole culture is moving towards automation. Um, five years, ten years ago, you probably thought, actually, I won't be driving a driverless car when it's here already, and that's trust. You're not trusting you're taking that trust element out of the way, increasing that trust element, you're trusting a machine rather than anything else. So yes, we are moving towards automation. We're all moving towards a more acceptable culture uh, for automation as well. And that's where I think, that's my proposition, that's my hypothesis, is that if we, if we focus on automation and management the, the management theory around allowing people to grow and work and prosper rather than trying to get people to come on a, a journey on purpose will probably wait, probably save a lot more money and probably get more employee engagement. That is my presentation. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank That's you. amazing. Thank you, you. To, uh, you, Thank you. you can't walk off. You have to have the customary hug. Huh? Oh, yeah, hug yeah. <laughs> that was brilliant.